like to call the meeting to order, please. If we could stand and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we do have two people signed in wishing to speak tonight. Uh, Will and Shirley Barnes. I thought that was just an attendance. It's just an attendance? Okay, not a problem. He spoke. I did the same thing my first week. That's okay. You're welcome to speak if you'd like, though. Well, with that, we have no written communication. Uh, we do have some uh, special committee reports, though. Um, uh, yeah, the policy committee met uh, last week and um, reviewed several policies that were included in the agenda this evening. Um, they were just uh, all revisions to current policies, just to update um, some protocol and uh, some changes that OCS has since. So, pretty straightforward. And then I also attended the um, Erie County Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly, as I am the board delegate representative to DCISB. And um, most of the meeting was spent talking about the budget and um, the changes to the leadership team, which I think we probably have talked about before, um, that they're moving to a two-person leadership team, um, a point eight and a point four. Um, so that they'll have some overlap um, should anything uh, ever happen to one or the other of them and um, also have some specialization also. <clears throat> um, the thing to note though is that their budget uh, would increase by almost a hundred thousand um, dollars and it's I think a pretty uh, conservative number at this point so it could be less but uh, it would be a pretty big hike to their budget, but there is also, um, it, it's still almost a balanced budget at this point by ECSB, <coughs> and they have a very strong fund balance. So it should be no problem there. And I think along the way, all the different, you know, the budget committee and the delegate assembly and things like that have all been in favor of the change. Um, the next steps they're going to take is to develop job descriptions and establish a timeline for the recruitment of the new executive director. And um, when we went around the table and the different districts were talking about what's going on in their districts, there's a lot of community forums that are taking place um, in different districts. And it, it, we didn't have a chance to really get into detail about those. Um, but the next one is going to be at Williamsville North, January 31st, which is a Wednesday at 7 o'clock. If anybody wanted to check out this community forum, see what it's all about. Um, and that's about it. Okay. Um, I attended the Erie County Association of School Boards legislative team meeting. Um, and. Uh, Basic, the basic conversation was about the fact that there's very little detail available about the governor's budget proposal so far. Um, it was kind of an overview as opposed to detail about where the numbers might fall. Uh, overall, the theme is that now is a good time to advocate for funding um, because there's a lot of moving parts and those um, specific <coughs> line items aren't necessarily written in stone, so everybody should be sending letters to their um, legislators and, and um, other representatives and let them know that we would like more funding for education from the state. The superintendent and I talked earlier today on this and we're going to making sure our web page gets updated with our advocacy information and stuff. So Are we going to push that out somehow? <coughs> yes. We're, Mr. Pinnell mentioned about pushing it out through ASPEN, um, through the PTAs. Yeah, that would be great. And then he and I will uh, make appointments to go meet with um, both Senator Ransomhopper <coughs> and um, Assemblyman Walter. Okay. The information about who covers us specifically is up to date. It's just the, um, the, issues. the verbiage isn't updated. On our website, yeah. yeah. So we'll get that going. All right. Any other committee reports? Okay. No, later this week we have an audit committee. Um, all right, let me turn it over to you. Okay. 
Um, first item I have in the superintendent's report, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Schoenfeld and many of our um, students and par um, parents and teachers here um, to talk about the 2018 Dr. Martin Luther King Fine Arts Essay and Exhibition. We had great participation locally, um, which resulted in many of our students' artwork and essays being featured in Albany um, over the last couple weeks. So Dr. Schoenfeld here is here to share the great news about our participation in this contest. Thank you. I'm pleased to speak in front of you and recognize some of our students and teachers for uh, the work that's been done. Uh, it happened during a busy time of year in December. Uh, so oftentimes it's challenging to do some extra things on top of everything else you're doing. Um, but we had people step up and uh, do some really nice things. I'll just walk you through uh, a PowerPoint that shows some various things um, that will help you to understand it a little better. This first came to my attention by our superintendent. He sent a memo from New York State Ed. Uh, he oftentimes, and so do many administrators, get a lot of emails. Um, but he sent one on this opportunity of a partnership with the New York State Ed Department and the New York State uh, Museum that's in our capital. And they work together to offer an opportunity to help celebrate uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And um, there were two ways uh, people can participate. One of them was an original art piece where they would illustrate uh, Dr. King's six traits um, or steps to nonviolence and six principles. So those, that was one way uh, students could participate. The other one was to write a one-page essay that was really looking at how can we celebrate um, his message throughout the year, but not just um, one day or one uh, month of the year. Uh, we were lucky enough to have five teachers in our district accept the opportunity to share this out and uh, sort of work with their students to participate. I know Mrs. Fordham's here and Mrs. Clemens. Could you just give a quick wave? Um, and we also had uh, a couple other teachers uh, that I'll mention at the end of the production. They're not here tonight, uh, but they were able to help uh, work with our students on this opportunity. Um, State Ed and the Museum of New York uh, are really close to one another. And we sent our, submitted 11 of our, I'll say, the top works. We, do, as you can see throughout the board uh, office, we have some of the artwork on each side of uh, the board. And to the back, you see some of the essays and artwork as well. 11 of our pieces by uh, division, by uh, grade level, was submitted to the curator of the museum. It's strange that we're sending our students' work to a curator, but it was pretty nice to be able to do that. Um, so I'll step through some of this with you. Uh, one cool thing is um, I wasn't able to get to Albany. I do travel there to do some work at times. but. Um, I have some connections with State Ed, so someone that I knew was able to go over to the exhibit that's literally uh, the Martin Luther King Art and Essay exhibit, and I traced that as best I could in blue, but that's um, the six pieces of artwork that were submitted to Albany um, and displayed with other students throughout uh, the state, so I just wanted to recognize that. We also were able to, with the help of Mrs. Christina Klein, our art teacher at the middle school, uh, put a display together downstairs in the middle school. Um, and you can see on the bottom side, those were the 11 pieces that uh, were submitted and displayed in Albany, but we made a copy of them and scanned them before we sent them out. So some of that work you'll see here uh, tonight. Uh, I also had my first experience on TV as an announcer, and it was pretty awkward, actually, because <laughs> people said, hey, sit down here. And when, when I went, actually, to stand there, uh, the camera cut off the top part of my, my body. So then they put me in this really small chair. <laughs> so on top of being reading from a teleprompter, uh, excited about the work that our students did, uh, it was a challenging feat. But, I did get the opportunity to thank our teachers and recognize the 11 students. Um, so that was done on our tech TV that we're doing in our innovation lab. So it was a pretty cool experience. Uh, tonight I'm going to uh, recognize, uh, these are our six students that have done artwork and they were submitted and part of the exhibit. So these students are going to come up and talk briefly about their work. We wanted to recognize them. so. Uh, I'll just uh, announce the names right now, but Emily Frankowski, Olivia Musset, uh, Emma Reagan, Torrance Barnes, Louisa Mohammed Sheriff, 
Sharif and uh, uh, Pramisha Pradhan. So if you uh, ladies could come on up, I'm gonna have you, as we go through, share a couple <laughs> words about your work. You can all come up. Yeah. <laughs> is not with us today, but she, did a nice, she had a couple nice pieces. This one had, had I Have a Dream on the left arm, and then another one you can't see all the detail of sort of flowers and positive uh, growth on the other arm. Um, Olivia, did you want to say a couple words about your piece? Um, I made the bird have its open wings toward love with the white and black person, and it's holding an olive branch to represent peace between them. Very nice. Thank you. And Emily Frankowski? <coughs> See, peace, love. I have a dream. That's what many people may think when they think Martin Luther King Jr. That's one of the things I think. Everyone is their own art material, whether it's paint, oil pastel, crayon, marker. That's why I use many art materials to make my piece. As you can see in my piece, there are two hands conjoining. That means that we all need to work together to create a better world. Thank you. Sure. Emma Regan? Um, when I made this piece, I wanted to show everyone how there are so many ways that you can choose being kind and loving towards others in so many ways that you can do the exact opposite. And she's facing towards the ways that are kind and loving because she is choosing that path and trying to be the best person that you can. And that's all you can really do. So that's what I did. <laughs> And Louisa? The, the point of my piece was that it's really hard to draw the perfect world, but the guiding hand has Martin Luther King's principles of nonviolence, and that can help to make it just get a little bit closer to perfect. Um, my drawing was mostly focusing on Martin Luther King's principles of nonviolence. And I remember a quote he once said, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. Thank you. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> we also had the essay portion, and I want to say we had over, we probably had about 12 submissions. <laughs> and we submitted uh, five full essays, one page long. It could be handwritten or typed. We have a couple of uh, students here today, but what I thought might be nice to do with this is uh, take their essays and then take one paragraph as best I could in reading it and fitting them together to make a semblance of a Martin Luther King Jr. essay that we can share. Um, so any of our students that are here, I'll read all the names, but. Please come up if you're one of the authors, Lillian uh, Plansky, Alyssa Enders, Allison Witten, Miriam Zhu, and Taylor Ross. There might only be two here. <coughs> you can come on over here, okay? I'll fill in for the others. Uh, Lillian, do you want to start? On January 15th, Dr. Martin Luther King Day is celebrated. We celebrate him because he broke the color barrier that once controlled people. This barrier kept bad things like racism, militarism, and poverty strong. When his speech in 1963 was delivered, it changed everything. Now every January 15th is celebrated as the day it all changed. So why do we just celebrate him one day? We should celebrate him all year. We can do that by living his dream and staying away from his three evils. Poverty, racism, and militarism. To celebrate him all year round, he must live the dream by not being racist and demonstrating equality, justice, and freedom. I'll step in for Alyssa, thank you. A way to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is by teachers having their students trace their hands and write what their dream is on that cut out hand, which would then be hung around the school. This would be in honor of King's great I Have a Dream speech. This gets children thinking about how fortunate they are to have a diverse community. Some places aren't as fortunate as America. 
because it is important to understand that the discrimination still goes on in other countries. In addition, King's I Have a Dream speech was very impactful towards modern day life. I'll also read for Alison Witten. <clears throat> Another way we can remember Martin Luther King Jr. is spreading his words as far as we can. Words can lift the mind as well as the heart and be informing others of King's in ingenious ideas. We can introduce people to the beautiful philosophy of nonviolence. King did not just write to write, but wrote to be read and heard. Today we often forget how lucky we are to have the freedom and education that we do. Martin Luther King Jr. did not take these things for granted, and we should be obliged to do so too. So next time you say, I hate my life or this stinks, remember that it could be a whole lot worse Honor Martin Luther King Jr. by letting people know how lucky they really are. And Miriam Zhu. My own personal experiences tell me the power of Dr. King's philosophy. When I was a kindergarten though, just starting at my new elementary school, a girl made fun of me and pinched my face on the school bus because of my race. Even though it wasn't easy, I didn't fight back. I suffered through my elementary years dealing with others teasing me and harassing me because of my race. But instead of complaining hate, I kept to being the best version of myself each day. I worked hard, persevered, and kept my chin up whenever I wasn't sure which way to go. I looked deep inside for courage and took the initiative to ask for help from good teachers and nice friends. I made friends. I knew I could do it. Today, I am proud of myself that I was able to overcome these obstacles and make my way always with a smile on my face. Later on, the girl that finished me became my friend and even invited me to a birthday party. I have learned that being different isn't easy, but more important, I have learned to, to bravely, bravely confront it with courage. Thank you. And the last um, <clears throat> paragraph brings us up to speed. Uh, when looking back on this decade, we would be called the decade of change. Inspired the, by the work of Dr. King, this generation has become mo more proactive about speaking against problems and using our voice to be the change we want to see in the world. Whether it be Black Lives Matter, sparked by the unjust deaths of black men like Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and Philando Castile, or the Women's March on Washington to rally support for having the ability to seek reproductive sex, sexual health, this generation has become one of the loudest since the original civil rights movement. And by standing up for what we believe in, we continue to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King every day. By using our voice to fight for equality, safety, and mutual prosperity, we all use the ideas Dr. King strived to cement in the country 50 years ago. In this generation, we all have a dream. So thank you for that, and thank you for reading. Just in closing, I appreciate the New York State Ed Department offering this opportunity, partnering up with the Museum uh, of New York State, Superintendent Pinella, for sharing this and agreeing that it's a worthwhile thing for us to share with our educators and students. Again, Mrs. Clemens is here, and. Mrs. Klein was very helpful with the artwork and helping to uh, post these and, and share them. Mr. Farina, uh, Mr. Close, um, Mrs. Fordham's here I recognized as well. So thank you for your help at the high school. And Mrs. Zach is my administrative assistant and she was also help, helpful in the organizing and judging and um, putting this information together tonight. That being said, is there any questions or anything you'd like to ask myself? I just want to say thank you for sharing with us. We're, we're humbled by all this. Yeah, These young surprising. people, it's amazing. Pretty cool. It grew from their just the artwork, their writing. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to our students, families, teachers um, for participating in this. It was evident in what was presented here that you represent the ideals of Dr. King um, in your everyday actions. This just gave you a platform to express it in different avenues. So um, very impressive and 
at a time when our country can be char characterized as uh, um, divisive. Um, certainly, I'm proud of the fact that here in Amherst we um, are accepting and we are proud of our diversity and we celebrate that. So thank you. We have one more item in the superintendent's report. Uh, Mrs. Lavin and Mrs. Flanagan and some uh, staff from Windermere are here to provide us with a, an update on the Windermere Building Action Plan, um, which is aligned to our district's strategic um, action plan or strategic plan. Welcome. Good evening. Um, Ms. Lavin and myself are here tonight to share with you an update of our action plan. So, in our last presentation by Smallwood, uh, Mr. Lewis and Mr. Crozier sort of gave you um, a, an overview of the collaborative process that took place that all of the, the participants at the district and at the school building level participated in creating their plan. We too went through that same collaborative process, but ours started a couple years ago. Um, in turn of, in our year one, we started actually writing our plan, which was three years ago, under our Excellence and Equity Committee. And that was the first year that we began researching best practices and began the development of our plan. The year after, we began actually implementing our plan. And with any cycle of improvement, we always go through assessing, revising, monitoring, and adjusting which brings us up to year three, which is the current year that we're in, and we have fully aligned it to the district plan and of those three priorities. As you guys well know, the district has charged us with hitting three priorities. Tonight, Mrs. Flanagan and I are gonna talk about each of those district priorities and highlight two Windermere action steps for you. The first one is learning and achievement. And the action steps that we're going to share with you are around increasing our ability to use technology in the classroom and informational writing. This is the first year where we're really taking a look at what ways can we support our teachers in the area of technology. To do that, Mrs. Flanagan and I are working with three master teachers in our building. Chad Mosier, our library and media specialist, Lindsay Mack, who is our enrichment teacher, and Lauren Smith, who is an ENL teacher. These three teachers are really masterful in their use of technology, so Mrs. Flanagan and I have been meeting with them this year for us to learn from them and for the group of us to understand what exactly do we want to do? What's our vision? What's our goal for teachers? After engaging in lots of discussion, reading lots of articles that Lauren specifically has shared, we decided our vision for teachers is to help them be really comfortable and confident in using technology to lift up instruction to help motivate and engage our students. We want for our students to use technology to start to construct knowledge, to use technology to really be creative communicators, so that means going beyond just using verbal or written word, but using visual images and videos and audio. And we want them to start to use technology to be innovative designers. We've invited Mrs. Smith, and we're really glad to have her here. And she's going to highlight some of the things that we're doing in our building. Uh, so when Mary, Julie, myself, Chad, and Lindsay met as a team, um, we looked at the international standards for technology education for students. And looking at those standards, these were the three goals that we came out with for our students. Um, in order to help our teachers become more comfortable and use the technology to confidently lift their instruction, we plan to use a gradual release model where Chad, Lindsay, and I will work with teachers to co-plan and co-teach, and we will model how to use the technology with students. Um, as we move along on that gradual release of responsibility, we will then co-plan, continue to co-plan and co-teach with teachers in their own classroom so that they begin to use the technology with us side by side, eventually moving teachers to become confident enough and comfortable enough to use that technology in all parts of their instructional day. Um, I would like to show you some examples of how we've already begun to, to use technology and integrate technology in our classrooms um, across a few different grade levels. Um, my first example is going to be how we're showing students in fifth grade to become creative communicators. 
Um, I'm a co-teacher in Toby and Wood's fifth grade language arts class. And one way that we have started using technology is with the writing process. We really wanted to help students refine and um, practice their writing skills. So the way that we've been using Google Docs to refine and practice the writing process is we gave students their writing rubric right up front. So they started with their writing rubric and then they were given a graphic organizer. On this graphic organizer, students worked and filled in the graphic organizer with constant teacher input. So on the graphic organizer, as you can see, there's different colored writing. The blue writing is what the graphic organizer prompts would be. So for example, where it says background info, the students were given just those words, background info, and some pre-teaching on what that background info is. They, the black writing would have been what a, a student would have typed in as an answer. And then a teacher was able, before they moved on to other parts of the essay, to give them feedback. And they did that in two ways. The red writing is model writing from the teacher. So the student was able to see by the different colored fonts, like, oh, this is what my teacher would have written. And here's an example. The other feature that Google Docs really helped us do with our students is the constant feedback. It's a little hard to see over there. But the teachers were able to constantly leave comments and what this did for students was give them constant opportunities to conference throughout the writing process. It left, um, it gave the teachers the opportunity to access several students at one time via the technology, and it really helped students to continue their writing process and not feel like they had to sit and wait to conference with teachers. It really increased the engagement and the work time that students did while doing the writing process. And what they did was they took all that work and that feedback on the graphic organizer and drafted a complete essay. So in fifth grade, they really did become creative communicators and it was a really powerful tool for them to, to move their writing forward. Another example that I wanted to show you was the students in second grade. Um, we used Google Earth to increase motivation and get students really excited about starting to learn about maps. We started a geography unit by using Google Earth and as you can see on my screen, students were able to look at their community in the context of the entire world. The technology enabled the students to increase their motivation and really want to begin to learn about maps. The teacher was able to start with the globe and then zoom into the country and then into New York State. And then all the way down to Amherst, New York, students were able to see their own personal community within the context of the world and could even find their school and their neighborhood and their home, which really excited second graders to learn more about maps. It really increased the engagement and the excitement throughout the whole rest of the unit. And the students really enjoyed it. Um, it was our big wow factor at the beginning of that unit. So, <laughs> Windermere Boulevard School, they thought that was really neat. So. <laughs> And then the last example um, I'm going to share with you is from Chad and Lindsay, who actually were able to co-teach and co-plan a problem-solving unit using Azobots. Um, Azobots are small robots that read color codes. And when I, mean, when I say codes, I mean computer codes. And the students were able to use these robots to um, learn some problem-solving skills. And I'm actually going to let the video that Chad and Lindsay produced show you a little bit more about that. I'm Lindsay Mack, and I'm the Enrichment Specialist at Windermere. I'm Chad Moser, and I'm the Library Media Specialist here at Windermere. In years past, we've both worked with second grade students separately to explicitly teach various thinking skills in isolation. However, it became apparent that this was not the most effective method for our students, and they weren't applying this knowledge outside of our classes. We also noticed many of our students lacked the necessary problem-solving skills needed to excel in problem-based learning and STEAM. They had a difficult time working to solve problems independently and often turned to the teacher for help or gave up altogether. After much discussion and planning, we created and now co-teach a STEAM-based mini unit that promotes these skills with our second grade students. In this unit, students learn coding concepts using Azobot robots. This helps them grow and apply the problem solving skills they were previously lacking. I use the stop and stamp with the working and the try something new. 
And when did you figure out that something wasn't working? Where did you tell me your code was? I put the code right there. And then when I put my awesome bot there, I realized it sometimes it went that way or it went whoop. At this side. And then what did you do after you stopped? You used to stop and think. I tried something, you would put it right there. Then when I put my eye on the box, it went three times to the fish. Nice I also job. enable students from all walks of life to succeed in a more digital age and give them strategies to be more independent and persevere through difficult situations in both their classroom and at home. By the end of this unit, we found that our students are able to not only identify specific problem-solving strategies that might help when they get stuck, but also to apply these strategies when completing difficult tasks. are very very fun. Mm -hmm. We all really like how they move on those hop on those lines. Well if it doesn't work you can problem solve. You can like when you're stuck on one of those codes on an iPad, you can like use a code or something or like put it behind or in front or sideways to get to finish. I think it was very 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 fun. Straight and do a little circle, and then keep on going. And they, but sometimes it wouldn't work. Restart it and see if it'll work again. If it didn't work that time, I'll, I would get to race the car with you and just make a straight line. Thank you, Lauren. You are a, a valuable member to our faculty and staff, and you've helped us in, in many ways with your knowledge. Um, so as we go on, another area in learning and achievement is the creation of a committee on the area of writing that focuses on the development of common writing rubrics. And in this clip, you're going to hear from Lauren Ladowski, who's a fourth grade teacher, also a member of the writing committee, who's going to share our work and efforts so far. common writing rubrics. We work diligently to align our rubrics to the standards and immerse ourselves in cross-curricular discussion. Each rubric was created with knowledge of the grade level before and after to help teachers and students create common language and bridge any gaps. We have created rubrics for narrative, informational, and opinion writing. Our next step was to then create student-friendly checklists that also align to our teacher rubrics. These were created to be student-friendly in language and appearance, so students can easily understand the expectation of a three at each grade level. This school year, the writing rubrics were rolled out to teachers as a working document. We want teachers to use them with their writing units and during collaborative scoring to provide the committee with feedback. This creation of writing rubrics has been such a collaborative process, and I can't wait to see the positive benefits it has across all grade levels. You saw also in the clip before one of the rubrics they had used um, through the creation of our work in the writing committee. And so this year that has been vetted out with teachers to get constant feedback to update those. So as we go forward now into priority two in student life, student life is really, it's the embodiment of the whole child. And in this area, we want to focus on two really important action steps. Um, we are focusing on our implementation of a responsive classroom approach, which again um, builds relationships with students and families. And also we want to highlight for you the work of our character education committee and some of the new initiatives they've taken on this year. So faculty and staff at Windermere have had a long history of helping our students follow our school-wide rules. We call those school-wide rules the Windermere Care Code. Parents help with these rules are posted in gyms, classrooms, all our shared space. This year we're really excited to start this journey in responsive classroom. We believe this is going to help teach our children some of the social and emotional skills that will really help them be caring, courteous, and careful. Responsive Classroom is an evidence-based approach that takes social emotional development and aligns it with academic success. Kim Ignatius is a first grade teacher 
who has been putting a lot of these practice in, practices into play in her classroom. And you guys get to watch another video. She was gracious enough for us to pop into her classroom so you could get a feel for, you know, what does a responsive classroom look like? So, Kim Ignatius and first graders are gonna show us. Every day my class begins with a meaningful morning message. It bridges yesterday's learning, thoughts and feelings with today. My children expect it, enjoy it, and they thrive on the sense of routine and community. After announcements each day, my class gathers together on the rug to greet one another. This greeting is explicitly modeled and practiced. Three students who have signed up to share will verbalize an issue next. They can talk about experiences, feelings, or impending life events. They can choose two friends to offer questions or comments after. It is a truly interactive listening and speaking experience. After share, the kids know it's time to engage in an activity, and many times Go Noodle is chosen. As a class community, we list our greetings and activities throughout the year so that we can pick our favorites later on to repeat. Although morning meeting doesn't take long, it is a crucial part of our responsive classroom environment. Interactive modeling is a straightforward technique that's proven to be very effective for teaching procedures and routines in our classroom. It shows all students exactly what to expect when we ask something of them. It lets them watch, notice, comment, compliment, and be a part of an engaging experience. So this is what we're gonna do. Mrs. I is going to pretend she's in your class. She's gonna put away a poll. She's gonna tell me what you notice. Are you ready? What did you notice? What did you see? What did you hear? Um, Alana. Quiet B. Anything else? Benji? Um, Quiet B, calm body. Who would like to be partners? Show us again, we're gonna notice you. How about we do Cece and Andrew? Okay, Taylor, a compliment. You came right back to the rug and sat your body down. So did TJ. Who else has a compliment for the voice? Go ahead, Afna. Um, Any other compliments, ladies? Good to see the boys notice that you guys made a what? Uh, We're really proud of you. All right. Although it seems like interactive modeling is time consuming, the seven steps actually help me gain time in my classroom later on in the year. It helps cut down on confusion and procedural questions. I hope that gave you a good idea of the communities we're building in our classroom and what we hope to do school wide. So this year, to be able to do those sorts of things across the school, our whole building has engaged in a book study and we're reading <coughs> rules in school, teaching discipline in the responsive classroom way. We have met as a faculty to engage in discussion around this book and it's been a really interesting way in which the committee, our school action, strategic action plan committee decided to do this. They built these things called vertical families. They want to really emphasize that community feel and it wasn't just a vertical meeting, they're families. And these families consist of teachers pre-K through five who get together and talk about the practices that you just saw and that are talked about in this book. We're really excited about this journey. And next year, the district has, in support of this, has provided us with the opportunity to train a cohort of teachers, and they're gonna become turnkeys for us as we continue down this like really wonderful journey. So the other highlight, highlighted action step is about making sure when we teach character education, it's engaging and responsive to our kids and families. When we talked about doing that, our character ed committee said, well, you know, if we want this to be engaging, it better be fun. All of the schools in Amherst have agreed upon certain character education traits that we're all responsible for explicitly teaching and they go by the acronym Tiger's Care. This committee has taken those traits 
and have really worked hard to make them come alive. One thing that they've done is they've planned 10 theme days. I remember I said they wanted to be engaging and they want them to be fun and they also want them to be teaching. So in September, when we talk about tolerance, they have tip your hat to tolerance. Kids wore crazy hats and we were all very tolerant of the different tastes that were represented. November was groovy with gratitude. Kids wore really groovy clothes. And they also talked about in the classroom all the things that we have to be to show that we're to show gratitude about. December was empathy. And so our theme day for that trait was empower with empathy. And Windermere, Windermere Halls were just like full of these marvelous little superheroes streaming around. They took that idea and the character committee also then said, we're going to plan four assemblies to make sure that our kids are really understanding what these character traits are. In December, the photos that you see here the school assembly was a rocking character ed piece which was specific around empowering with empathy. Um, the committee presented morning videos throughout the whole month which showed student superheroes what it meant to be empathetic in our school, ways that they were brave enough to overcome obstacles and be successful, ways in which they were empathetic with friends who might be going through some harm times. They ended up with this assembly that highlighted students in orange capes who came zooming into the auditorium as the whole student body cheered for them. They talked about the trait. The student body then chanted, respect, respect, or tolerance, tolerance, and cheered them on. Our teachers, as indicated in that picture, led the student body in a cheer that talked about those traits. And then really, one of the highlights was that our high school was invited in, and the cheerleaders and basketball teams told stories of what it meant to embody these character traits throughout their whole school career. So we had cheerleaders who were talking about obstacles like being adopted or divorce and how that affected them as a student. Our kids were mesmerized. Mm -hmm. Then of course the basketball stars came out and were flipping their balls and making baskets. They look like the Harlem Globetrotters, <laughs> if anybody knows who they are anymore. Anyway. <laughs> um, but it was really, really motivating and a really wonderful job. Our character ed team is making these character traits come alive in our school, so kudos to them. We have a lot of teachers who are working on that endeavor. And our last priority is Amber's Pride. Um, our parent advisory group um, sort of gave a reboot this year to that committee made up of parents, as well as Ms. Lavin and myself. And this was the one priority that they chose to really focus on and work towards. And what they're working on is how can we further promote all the great things that Windermere does and how can we represent ourselves to the community at large. And so this committee, this committee of parents is, is really committed to doing that. And we, you know, we just had a meeting with them yesterday and they just brainstormed all these incredible things about Windermere and then brainstorming, well, how can we get this out? How can we push it out? What PR can we do? And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working with Lori Sasenko, um, the district PR representative, as well as um, Superintendent Pinella and administrators in district office. And we're going to work towards looking at how we can maximize um, our current PR tools that we already have, such as our new website and some of the current social media tools that we have as well. So with any cycle of improvement, it's really important, as Ms. Lavin and I do constantly, we're always measuring and monitoring outcomes. You start with a plan, you implement it, you monitor, you see, did it work, did it not work, what do we need to change, what do we need to do differently. So we always keep a close eye on our student achievement as well as looking just as our kids as a whole. In year one, back in 2014 of 2015, our ELA proficiency rates for students in grades three through five that had taken the New York State assessment was at 33%. And this was not good enough for us, and we knew that there were areas that we needed to improve in, and we knew that we could do better than this. And so this was really the tipping point of which started our Excellence and Equity Committee and started the writing and development of our first action plan. So from there, we thought, okay, how do we do after year two? So again, we looked at our results and we were so incredibly pleased to see, wow, our hard work and our efforts have really paid off. We've increased up to 
So then we thought, okay, we're, we're really working so hard. And when I mean we, it's really the, the teachers and the students are working so hard on improving. And so we thought, okay, how do we do last year? And in last year, we went up to even 52%. So what does this slide illustrate? It illustrates that our hard work and efforts are really headed in the right direction. As Mrs. Flanagan said, we do monitor outcomes measured by hard data. We also work really hard to look at, are our kids enthusiastic? Are our classroom communities cohesive? How are our kids feeling about school? And those things, though harder to represent, we feel we're moving in the right direction. And it's not just one teacher. It's not just one administrator. It's everybody. We are so happy to be here representing our teachers, our faculty, our staff, our clerical, because it's through all of their efforts we've been able to achieve it. You can get a lot of people together, and you can have a lot of people work really, really hard. But you have to make sure you're all focused on the same thing. And what we do at Windermere is we focus on these little superheroes. And it makes our job easier. talking about doing the co-teaching mm -hmm. um, with the, the teachers and you know creating the Google Docs and mm -hmm. being able to work on the comments and things like that. Is that a, a building wide? You're working with all the teachers? Is it phasing over years? I mean, that's a lot of um, so folks. This year, as part of my title funded position, um, I am working with the three through five teachers <coughs> Um, kind of on an as-needed basis for technology integration and um, because I'm also an ESL co-teacher in those in two of the fifth grade classrooms um, the fifth grade teachers really have started to kind of implement and use that as part of their writing process um, they're realizing Toby and Woods who I co-teach with really has embraced using the Chromebooks and Google Docs so it kind of started with that and then got the ball rolling with a lot of the other teachers because we realized how engaging it was for the writing process and how great it was for the kids. So um, I don't think it's a building-wide thing, but it's becoming Talk a little bit about too. K through one and two. Uh, how are you using technology in your co-planning with kindergarten? Oh, so um, the other part of my title-funded position is I am implementing project-based units with K one and two. So I rotate. Um, through those grade levels in theme, so either science or social studies. And as part of those projects, we are um, modeling with teachers how to integrate technology with the students. So um, for example, this week we're starting a unit about um, space cycles and patterns, and the end result of that unit is we are gonna have first graders create either digital storybooks or Google slideshows to show how they can make a prediction based on an observation about space. So um, we all have one-to-one devices, so it makes it easy because we don't have to worry about do I have access to the technology, it's making sure the teachers are comfortable with using it, and that's kind of where I come in. So it's the first year, and we're working hard with the three leaders, mm -hmm. and Julie and myself, to figure out how do we make sure we're doing this well. And we want to take our time to chunk it out slowly, and to make sure that we're aligned as we start to grow this. And having master teachers in terms of in the area of technology, such as uh, Lauren, when she's in classrooms, teachers are learning so much. So they're getting little snippets of it and then they're realizing, I can really do this on my own. And there are some teachers who are just, they knew Google Classroom from the minute we hired them and so they knew how to get that going too. And so it's, it's spreading now, but that is a big part of our plan is to, to utilize more of that in all classrooms. That's great. So it's just great a more efficient way teachers. too of teaching and Absolutely. learning in terms of the collaboration and then the evidence that you have in terms of that collection. Okay. I had a question. Uh, the paragraph, you were talking about, about the paragraph construction and how they can, you know, the teachers can work with more than one child at a time. Is that, have you noticed, is it improved their ability to create a theme and paragraph construction? And, so I can only speak on behalf of my particular group of students, but um, with my ENL students in particularly, it's extremely helpful because they're students who 
struggle with the writing process just like regular fifth graders, but also struggle with vocabulary selection. And there's other linguistic components that play into that. And it's really nice as their ENL teacher to have access to, let's say, three out of my six students on my caseload at the same time. I can have their tabs open on my screen and I can see that maybe Fatima is struggling and she might get stuck in, in a class where I would have to be conferencing with one student at a time. She might be stuck there for a few minutes until I can get to her because I'm only one person. With the technology, I'm able to look at multiple tabs and say, okay, I can see that Fatima is struggling with this one point. Let me give her one example to show her and get her moving and then move on to the next kid. So it increases my productivity as a teacher and increases the amount of when I say FaceTime, it's not my actual face, but the amount of FaceTime that they have with a teacher getting constant teacher feedback. So it is really helpful. And I do see an increase in their English language writing ability and also their ability to move along the continuum on the writing process. Okay, that's really fascinating, the writing, how, how technology mm -hmm. can help kids put a predicate and noun together and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second question I had, you talking about public relations piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, Think of all the graduates of Windermere, where they are today. Mm -hmm. If you could somehow tie that into Windermere's mm -hmm. history, they're on Wall Street. They're they have a group on Facebook. I have friended them. Is, I tell oh them, we tell, them, we tell them all about the PTA, and, the pancake and, breakfast, and they come. And you're absolutely right. They're out there. Back, you know, symbolically, yeah. and these mm -hmm. men and women. I mean, it's amazing how the mm -hmm. kids have gone to Windermere. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can think of a handful. Of off the top of my head, <laughs> but anyway, it's, if, if you're going to do public relations, well, you've got a great That's potential great. Yeah, yeah. to use that as your, mm -hmm. you know, to help help along the way. Some test good testimonials. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And your attention. Thank you. That's great. Very well done. I appreciate you uh, all your hard work in putting that together. And Lauren, thank you for being here tonight. Um, also, thanks to all the teachers that were featured in the videos, it's nice to be able to step inside a classroom um, right here in the boardroom. Um, that is the end of the superintendent's report. Uh, all right. New business. I will need a motion for new business items. I make a motion for new business items 1A through T, 2A through E, 3B, C, E, F, G, and H. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving new business items F1 A through T, 2 A through E, and 3 B, C, E, F, G, and H, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Congratulations to <laughs> Mr. Bellas. Oh, yes. Uh, Still here. <laughs> congratulations, Mr. Bell. You are our new assistant superintendent. So we yeah. congratulate you on your promotion. Well deserved. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have any follow up action items? No. Then we will need a motion to convene to executive session. I'll make a motion to the new executive sessions for matters regarding employment of a particular person. We have a second? I'll second. Mr. Bob? All right. All those in favor of continuing to an executive session, please say aye. 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 Thank you, everybody, for coming.